Oh, that's a good song. Good to see you today. Welcome. Uh, you can find Isaiah chapter 6 in your Bibles or on your device if you want to read along or just listen as I speak. I suspect this is very familiar to many of you, maybe some still learning this, and maybe this is the first time, that's okay too. But I want to start with reading what we already read in case you missed it. This is good. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6, 1 to 4. And let me remind you of some things this morning. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. I don't know if you know the background of this, but King Uzziah died 740 B.C. probably. He was a great king of Israel, except that his later years were not so great. His problems multiplied, his life hit an all-time low, his pride pride became his downfall as one day he thought, I'll go in and offer incense to the Lord at the temple. And God struck him in that moment with leprosy, which endured until his death. You can read about that in Second Chronicles. Since the king is dead, this is going to be a really tough year for Isaiah and for the people of God. And the rest of the book is going to describe what is not very pleasant to describe. And in it, Isaiah declares judgment on the people and on the leaders and on their worship. And in case anybody would say, well, who gives you the right to say these things? This chapter explains the source of his authority. His words and his judgment are not at the whim of some mere man. He is a prophet. He's the prophet of God. And he's faithful to the duties that have been given to him by his master. We don't know some of the circumstances behind this chapter. It fits well with just a visit to the temple. And if this young prophet is already in that area worshiping the Lord there, then it's almost the mixing of two worlds as God's kingdom, God's presence, God's rule, God's throne room comes down and fills this place and one transitions to the other. Imagine being in the temple. Imagine being in the area. The sights and the sounds and the smell of that magnificent structure, structure, a a feast for the senses. The sounds of worship inside and out. The smell of fresh baked bread on the table. Incense being burned. Cooked meat from the sacrifices still hanging in the air. And the sight of a beautiful gold and colorful tapestry, an ornate stone image lit by the shimmering glow of the candles of the menorah. Seen through the lingering smoke, what, what a day. But it is about to get so much better. As the real temple in some ways melts away before the prophet's eyes and he sees for the first time, the only time, what no man should see or be able to see. What a scene. He is in the moment, standing in front of the Lord at the throne room, not a place where humans dwell, who could stand before a powerful and pure God? No one. And even in a vision, the burden of that moment, as he sees himself for who he is, becomes very uncomfortable, and he is very uncomfortable. He finds himself out of place and out of sorts, but here he is. He shouldn't be there, but here he is. A man standing before the Lord, hard to imagine, That God is there and allows him to be there and see it, but he experiences it. The great, almighty, eternal God is seated on his throne, high and lifted up. His garment flows everywhere as his glory does. The place is filled with smoke. The foundations, the structure, the strongholds that are sturdy are now shaking. And and flying creatures, not, not angels, but heavenly bodies flying around, they are... They, they may look something like humans in some ways, but they're not humans. And even the original language, their description sounds more like fire or burning, so maybe they're, they are flaming. I don't know, but six wings, two covering their faces, two covering their feet, two flying with them. By the way, the only time in Scripture where seraphs are mentioned, we know about cherubs, they're seen through the Old Testament. Uh, For example, the the two gold cherubs bent over the Ark of the Covenant with wings spreading out. 
magnificent creatures in the scriptures, not as we might see this time of year, small, fat, cute, naked babies with tiny wings. Magnificent creatures. In Hebrew, the way to make cherub or seraph plural is to add im on the end, I am. So the plural of cherub is cherubim in Hebrew, or we would just add an S, so I don't know what your version shows there, but either is appropriate. These creatures flying around, calling out to one another, reminding each other of the truth, the reminder of reality, the chorus of praise, holy is the Lord, holy is the Lord, holy is the Lord Almighty. And the whole earth is full of His glory, and the voices rock the place, literally rock the place. I don't know that what we have done today rocks the place. We have done our best. I I believe this was heartfelt. But can you imagine what we are doing, joining with what they are doing, as in the old days, and in these days, and in the future days, all of the praises of all of the people and all of the angelic creatures, the hosts of heaven, everyone saying, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. They never tired of saying it, and may we never tire of saying it, piling on the praise of our God either. We don't know anything about the year, everything about the year, but we know what happens after this. The outlook for Isaiah and the people of God is bleak. This is a relatively young man, a prophet who has some years to live, but the king is dead. The nation is on a downhill slide toward the bottom. The Lord is promising judgment and the people refuse to change. Well, that's not good. Isaiah starts, stated that this is the start of something bad. As the year old king Uzziah died and it's only going to get worse. It's not just a historical marker stuck in the ground. It's like the stock market has crashed. The the people have invaded. We are at war. It's that kind of a bad news day. Everything is dark. The future is dark. And before very long, things are going to go from bad to worse and worse and worse as God's people will not recover from such a year for a long time. What's coming is devastation, captivity, total ruin. Only a remnant will survive. But in the midst of this horrible news, this doom and gloom year, this moment, here's the vision. A reminder to the prophet For all who see it, everyone who would read it, everyone like us to be reminded of it, no matter what happens on the earth, God is sovereign. He is king. He rules supreme. So verse 5, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from to- with tongs from the altar. And with it he touched my mouth and said, See, see, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Notice what the sight of a holy God has done to Isaiah. He is immediately brought to this. Conviction, confession, contrition. Conviction, confession, contrition keenly aware of who he is and who God is, and these two don't match. He bears his soul and says it like this, I am undone. I am unworthy. I am finished. It's the feeling of being embarrassed, like being stripped naked in the front of everybody. A horrible, horrible thought for most of us. Embarrassing. Vulnerable, exposed, unable to hide. The truth is there for all to see. And it's not about showing skin to the crowd. It's about God knowing us full well. As He sees and He knows. And I'll remind you again, right now, as nice as you look, we have all dressed up. We have fancied ourselves. Look at us. We have covered ourselves and more than that, we have covered the, covered the blemishes of our embarrassing past and hidden some of our sins, not just because it's inappropriate for God's people, but it's unthinkable we have done it. And still, He knows. And today in here, He sees. There is no hiding from Him. He knows. 
And Isaiah is deeply sorrowful and penitent over what God knows. And it's fitting to say, I'm a sinner, I am undone, I am ruined. Not a popular view of ourself these days. Americans don't want to show all of our faults, and some who do flaunt them, but still most normal people don't want people to know some of the worst. We only want people to see our best. So on podcasts and on, on the internet and on websites, we like to filter the bad out, even so our picture looks better than we look. We like to show our best, never our worst. 1707, Isaac Watts wrote a song, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed. I grew up singing that in church. And in the first verse, it says, For such a worm as I, for such a worm as I. But maybe you've sung that, and maybe you've sung a newer version where an editor likes to change that word to one, not worm, but one. For such a one as I. Because one sounds a lot better. Not nearly as despicable and uncomfortable as worm. Not a worm, a one. I'd like to put my two cents in and say, I think worm is appropriate. I think Isaac got it right. When compared with a holy God of the universe who is pure in every way, sinless completely, then I am more a worm than a man. I'll side with Isaiah and Isaac and say, when confronted with a holy God, with His holiness and righteousness and purity and majesty, what else can I think of myself? The stark difference between me and him, between us and him? Wow. You stand before God in full awareness of the truth. You see yourself as he sees you, knowing full well everything laid bare and the holiness of him against the sinfulness of me. It's time to come clean and to say it, the truth of it. No more pretending. He is holy and I am not. He is righteous and I am not. I am a sinner and he is not. I am undone and unworthy and unfit and he is certainly not. That's what worship should do to us. A vision of the holy God where we cannot be unchanged after seeing him in his glory. For Isaiah's condition, the solution of the moment, interestingly enough, is a lump of coal. Not like Santa might put in your stocking for being a naughty kid. This one has cleansing properties. There's something about it, probably still burning, red hot from the altar, snatched out of the the rest of the fire and carried by that heavenly creature and touching the lips of Isaiah, carterizing not the skin but the sin, where he is changed by the coal, purified and cleansed by the coal. What's magical about the coal? Nothing. It's symbolic. It's not the heat of the coal, but the holiness of the Lord that brings forgiveness and atonement. In an instant, guilt is gone, sin is gone. And if that doesn't bring gratitude from the one who has been forgiven, I'm not sure anything will. Let's finish the section. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I send me. The call is made, the question launches into the air, and it just sits there as the Lord says to himself, whom should we send? Who will go out for us? The booming voice has laid it out, and the required answer must come because the question is still hanging there, waiting for somebody to say something, and who should respond to that? Well, I guess Isaiah has to, since he's the only human standing there. And he says it in familiar words that sometimes we sing, Here am I, send me. The task may seem impossible as it's spelled out in the next verses. If you want to keep reading, please do. He's told to speak the condemning words of God to the people who don't care, whose hearts will remain hardened and unchanged, and the punishment will come, but keep telling them. He's up for the task because the Lord has changed him. And I don't think his willingness to go is so much out of compulsion as out of conviction. Not so much out of force, but forgiveness. Not from obligation, but true appreciation. And Isaiah goes out to do and goes on to do what God has told him to do. You can read the rest as I said. I'm not going to do that. 
So many differences between us and Isaiah. So many striking differences, but there are some similarities too. And I like how Butler has used this experience to describe what we can learn too. Three words from Isaiah. Isaiah was called, cleansed, and then commissioned. And here's your reminder. If you are in Christ, then you have been called. The Lord has chosen you before the foundations of the world to be His. He has created you for good works. He has adopted you into His family. He has called you His child. That's the language of the Scriptures. It's the truth for God's people. And I am no prophet, nor the son of a prophet, but I have been called. And not just as a preacher, you have been called. We have been called to follow Jesus Christ, and many may not answer that, but many in this room have. And grateful for the honor, right? Grateful for the honor. Now let me pause and speak to some of you. If you have not heard the call of Christ, have not chosen to follow, I'm telling you what Jesus has said over and over again to all kinds of people, follow me, follow me. Maybe some in here have not chosen not to, or maybe some in here have forgotten their calling to live lives worthy of their calling. That's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4. I urge you, I'm pleading with you, brothers in Christ, live lives worthy of the calling you have received. You've been called by God. Number two, you've been cleansed. Anyone who has been cleansed from their sin, anyone who has been cleansed from their guilt can point to one source, and only one source, it's the blood of Jesus Christ. Peter says, 1 Peter 1, it's not silver or gold that redeems you, it's the precious blood of Jesus. That's how you're redeemed. Just so you know, it wasn't a hot coal that cleansed the prophet's lips. It was the Lord. It's not the magical water in a baptistry that makes us clean and pure and new. It is God. By grace, God. God, through the death of His Son, saved us. If we're saved, the blood of Jesus is the cleaning agent, not the water. Covered by the blood of Jesus. Now we're different people if we've been cleansed. So, let me stop again and just say, to some of you, have you been covered in blood? Have you been immersed in Christ? Have you been saved by the only Savior? Have your sins been obliterated? If not, what is your hope? And what is your plan? And what are you doing? Back to the reminders. You have been called, you have been cleansed, and you have been commissioned. Just because the Lord tells some people to go doesn't mean they like it or welcome it or go. Moses didn't believe he was the right one for the job. Tried to talk the Lord out of it. Jonah hears the calling with his assignment and says, not this way, I'm going the other way. Isaiah, though, raises a hand in the air and says, I'll do it. I'll go, send me. Just a few weeks ago at the end of Matthew's gospel, we heard Jesus say it himself to his disciples, go into all the world. Make disciples of all of them. Baptize them. Teach them. That's our commission. Paul calls us today messengers of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians 5. Ambassadors for Christ. Calling out to a dying world with the good news. Come back to God. Be reconciled. When Isaiah got a vision of God, he got a taste of his glory. He got a touch from his cleansing power. And he got a question put to him. And Isaiah couldn't help but say, I'm here. I'll do it. Is that your story too? Isaiah was changed, forgiven, called by the Lord. Go, and he went. Is that what happened to you? We don't have to go out as representatives for God out of compulsion, as if someone has a gun to our head. Guilt doesn't really make good messengers, but gratitude does. I know how we all feel, even the preacher standing before you. Go out and tell the world. Change the world. Light up the world. I know what we say, but I don't feel qualified. Others can say it better than I can. I've messed up way too much in my past. I don't have the confidence to do it. How about instead of putting confidence in us, let's move it over and place it squarely on the shoulders of him who has called us and cleansed us and commissioned it. He can do it through us. Maybe we should pray, Lord, if you've called me to do it, and if you've equipped me to do it, and if you've filled me with your spirit to do it, and if you fully expect me to do it, then I'll do it. I'll try my best. 
to live out the truth, to speak out boldly, to, to live humbly as an example to all, to let my light shine brightly in this world. And, and even though we may feel like we're not the right ones to do it, God is the one to do it through us. Here am I, send me. I hope the truth is this of you. If you're a disciple, a follower of Christ, blood-washed, born again, immersed and redeemed saint, then you've been called by an almighty God. Do you know it? You've been cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Do you know it? And you've been commissioned to go with the power of the Holy Spirit and tell the good news of grace to the world. Do you know it? It may seem impossible, but it's not. Just this week, in this country, we, rem we remembered a, another anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the ones who died there. Four months after Pearl Harbor was hit, 1941, some, some men were told about this mission, and maybe you've heard of it. Impossible. Impossible. Uh, it would send a message to Japan that we could reach them, and we could defeat them. And the Allies had hope, and it would send a message to everyone in America, we can do this, we can win this. Uh, getting those B-52s close enough on an aircraft carrier and getting them off of that thing was hard enough because some of that had not been done before. Getting them all the way to Tokyo to drop the bombs and getting them back home safely, well, that was impossible. And the men were told, you may not make it home, you probably won't make it home. Impossible, some say, and they gladly agreed to go, agreed to go with Doolittle leading the group. Eighty men in 16 B-52s shocked the Japanese, delivered a message wrapped in bombs, and it was powerfully effective. And as they were told on the return flight, the plane started running out of air somewhere around the time they're reaching the coast of China, if not before. Two men died in the crashes. Eight were captured and tortured by the Japanese. Three were executed. Those Chinese who helped the Americans to safety, many of them, many of them were uh, tortured and killed too. But many of the men, most of the men, survived the ordeal. And each year after that, they made a pledge. They would celebrate the mission with a toast until the last dude little raider died in 2019. Impossible mission seems so, but the mission was too important to pass up, and I am grateful for the men who did it no matter the cost. I am no Doolittle Raider. I am no prophet of God named Isaiah, but I am a Christian, and no matter what it sounds like, as crazy it may, as it may seem, when the Lord asks, and who should I send? Whom shall we send? I want to say, here I am, send me. With a hand in the air, here I am, send me. What about you? Let's stand and sing. There's a stirring deep within me. Who